Guys, for this World Autism Acceptance Month, I was able to interview a friend of mine, Dr. Temple Grandin, all about different things about autism and relationships. I hope you enjoy this video. Here we go. For me, um, there's been a lot of um, you know discussion about whether it's person first or identity first language. Yeah. And that's made me do a lot of thinking. I'll be 75 this summer. Wow. I've been in the involved cattle industry for 50 years. Holy smokes. And one of the things that's uh, made life meaningful to me is having an interesting career and a career where in my industry, I have made some positive changes. Yeah. And right now, the age I'm at, I'm doing a lot of student meetings. I just got back from some fabulous um, veterinary meetings just last week. And in one of the meetings, I talked to young students who were thinking about becoming veterinarians mm -hmm. and talking to them about their careers. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I find very rewarding if I can help these young people to get into a career that they're going to really like. Yeah. Okay. Do you really want to be a veterinarian? I tell them, go shadow a veterinarian, find out what it's all about. Try Absolutely. that job on. And then you're going to find out you love it, or maybe you'll find out you'd rather do something else. Um, that I get satisfaction from. Yeah. And yeah. even when I was a teenager, I had a horrible time in high school, horrible time, bullying, teasing, called all kinds of names. Yep. Yep. And the only places I was not bullied and teased was friends who shared interests. That's it. And horses were big number one, <laughs> riding them, showing them. I basically ran a horse barn. I cleaned nine stalls every day. I fed them. I put them in and out. That's awesome. I also learned how to work doing that. Do you and think these were refuges away from bullying and teasing? Hundred percent. Do you think that, like, having something like, you know, do you think this built your relationships socially because you have that shared interest? Do you think that without yes. having, yeah, you know, because a lot of people I get asked the questions all the time. You know, how can my kid? you know, make friends. And I always say, well, they're making friends in the wrong place, I guess, because, you know, if they're into cycling and bikes and they go into like ski lessons, you know, they're never going to make friends with kids because they're not into the same thing. Right. Well, it's friends who shared interests. Yeah. And I have friends in the, in the cattle industry. I have mm -hmm. friends uh, uh, that build things. Mm -hmm. I have um, um, uh, academic friends. We love to discuss uh, different things. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I just love talking shop. Yeah, I had the most fun time on a plane the other day because I sat next to a lady who ran construction projects and we discussed concrete forming systems for a two hour flight. And oh, we yeah. had a fantastic time because we both find that concrete forming, tilt up construction and things like this are just so interesting to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I think, see, that's the thing, you know, like if, you know, so for me, um, like I, I love like business marketing and science yeah. and yeah. Uh, analytical data collection. So when I, when I meet somebody who's into analytical data collection for marketing, we just hit it off, you know, and it's kind of like, I make friends with those people without even realizing it. And I, right. I build those relationships, but when I'm put into situations, like if I have to go to a party or a formal dinner, you know, you know the same thing, you know, when you're invited to speak somewhere, you get all these fancy dinners and I, it's not really for me. And you have to sit down and talk to people that you have nothing in common or re relative interest with. And then you're like, you kind of become the outcast then because everyone else is like talking and you just feel really out of place. You know, well, I, I other, certainly do. Well, the other problem I have is attention shifting slowness. Hmm. There's a certain kind of social conversation that people have where they chit chat very fast back and forth about uh, sports themed stuff or jokes or um, uh, just um, very little content in the conversation. And they're having the greatest time. Hmm. Now, one of the problems I have is I can't follow these conversations. They go too fast. Right. And in a noisy restaurant, I cannot hear them. So what tends to happen in a fancy party is I find one person, I'll go talk to them for a while about something. And then I find somebody else to talk to. But these kind of five people in this back and forth chit chat conversation, I don't do that. First of all, I can't even follow it. <laughs> yeah, you know, totally I've, I've never really liked stand up comedians because by the time I'm laughing at the first joke, you said two more. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Just yeah. going too fast for me. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think there's there's a lot more of that with with people and the way that they live society. Now you know you get your kids who are like on Amazon and they're buying things just like boom boom. 
and that we're, we're used to have like a very quick paced society and i think people are trying to live their lives that way especially in conversation and in social conversations or social relationships and i'm pretty much like you I'd, i it takes a while to digest um you know what's going on um especially with you know you said comedians but even if I'm having a conversation with somebody like my spouse or like, you know, my family members, um, there's a condition called alexithymia, um, which impacts autism, obviously. And, and it's a where you you get the context of the conversation, but you don't really react to it until a while afterwards, which is causing this like delay in, in kind of really, really yeah. getting the, the concept. And I, and I totally feel for you there. I can, you... Rel- I can relate to that. And I sometimes have to think about it because I've, sometimes you t- say, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. But then when you think about it, yeah, then, then, um, but I, I, um, I think having a career is important. Um, you know, Elon Musk has announced that he's autistic. I always have thought that he was autistic after I read Ashley Vance's book about him, mm-hmm. but then he came out on the Saturday night live program and said he was autistic. Now I just read a full page spread in the new Wall Street Journal front page of the business section that he sold all his mansions. Yes, yes, he did. And I can relate to that because what's important to him, he found out having all his mansions wasn't important. What's important to him is SpaceX and his cars, his Teslas. That's the stuff that matters. And he wants to go live in some little prefabricated house down at his spaceport. In Texas, yeah, that's exactly right. And I can relate to that. I don't, I don't live real fancy nope. because I'm all about, you know, a, a career. And right now I'm very concerned that visual thinkers like me who are good at in, industrial design and art, mm-hmm. uh, we're having trouble graduating from high schools. We can't do algebra. I'm very concerned about this. And I've got mm-hmm. a new book coming out called Visual Thinking. It'll oh. come out in October. You can pre-order on Amazon right now. Oh, I'm excited Visual about thinking. that. And you have to um, put my name in along with it to find it. Sure. And and I'm concerned these kids are getting screened out, the ones that are like me. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I worked with people. We were building these great, big, huge factories for the meat industry. Mm-hmm. And I call them the clever engineering department. Barely graduated from high school, took a skilled trades class, now own a great, big, huge shop and have patents and are selling equipment around the world. And twenty uh, percent of those people are autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD, undiagnosed, and I have to be vague about what they make because sure. I cannot identify them. That's the thing, like you know, it's that's the potential. That's kind of when you're looking, you know, there's that whole thing, you know, if you're trying to judge a fish by climbing a tree, it's never going to amount to anything. No, it's Just kind of true. looking at like the potential of somebody who is on the spectrum, like ADHD or dyslexia, or autism, or whatever. It's like how they can how they can really contribute using their own skills of what they're really good at. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, if I said to you, right, you're going to be in charge of like kids toys. Yeah. It's not, it's not your level of expertise. You know what I mean? But if we were talking about cattle and, and, and production of, of slaughtering equipment, you know, you'd be, you'd be on it. Um, here's a question. What is the best relationship you have with somebody? Like who's your best friend or how did you meet one of your best friends? Well, some of my best friends are, um, I have former students that are best friends. I've got uh, people in the meat industry that I'm really good friends with. In fact, I'm going to be having a, um, a Zoom call with her later on this morning. Um, we work together to develop our American Meat Institute Animal Welfare Guidelines. Wow. That's like a long time ago, way over 25 years ago, we worked on that. Whoa. And we're still friends. Um, so I get a lot of the contacts you know, worth, worth through work. Now, one of the things I learned when I was really young, when you're weird, you sell your work. So here in my book, Thinking in Pictures, there's one of my drawings right there. And there's one of my projects. And uh, my way of doing an interview is to simply show a portfolio of the work. Mm. Just show the work off. Pictures, drawings, show That's- off my work. Yeah. I, you know, there's a, there's an entrepreneur called Russell Brunson who I follow um, and he's got ADHD and he does very, something very similar. He's a visual thinker. So all his books, like when you open the book, he, he like hand drawn these diagrams rather than kind of explaining a lot of it, he, he draws it out in diagrams. And I think that's great because that's how I like to, to visualize things. You know, I see them, something and I can digest it a lot easier. Well, the thing is, I, I think, look at the people I've worked with and mm-hmm. they're people late sixties and seventies now. Mm-hmm. People I've worked with that have metal fabrication shops that are definitely autistic. 
-hmm. very successful metal fabrication shops going from large to small, huge to small, uh, and patents. One, one of them I made posters out of all his patent diagrams and decorated his place with them. Really <laughs> liked his patent diagrams. That's awesome. And he's got, and I, I think they've, they're a lot happier owning those big shops and having those businesses than if they got so hung up on the autism label that that became their whole life. Right. That, that's a huge and, issue for a lot of people, right? And, and uh, what I'm seeing now is I'm seeing parents overprotect their kid to the point where they don't think he can do anything. Uh, Deborah Moore and I have another book, Navigating Autism, that's aimed at new parents, new teachers, and new psychologists. Don't get locked into the label. Yeah. Then they think, well, little Tommy can't, you know, do anything. Yeah. And then they put him in that box, though, don't they? Well, that's the problem. What would happen to Elon Musk Jr. Right. today? You see, he grew up with an entrepreneur. He wasn't playing video games. He was making them and selling them. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what he was doing as a child. Yeah. And he grew up building things, but he had that. But he also, that whole entrepreneur thing, we need to encourage that in children. Yes. It, it goes back to having lemonade stands. Yeah, uh, my sister and I had a disastrous Kool-Aid stand. This is where I learned that you have to have enough supplies. We ran out of sugar. <laughs> yeah, supply and demand. Yeah, I mean, but then again, it's logistics, it's business. And, you know, those things are lost. I think more of those things need to be taught or encouraged, at least in children. But I've always been into technology when I was growing up, you know, building things and making computers. And so if I hadn't have had that like, ability to, to explore those things, then again, you would have been, I'd have been put into this box. Oh, Dan can't do that. You know, he, he doesn't go to the cl classes like the, the other kids and, you know, you're not normal or whatever but you're absolutely right parents do put their kids in these kind of boxes and it kind of limits them on, on a great scale um so temple i have a question for you because i know we're going to be wrapping up quick pretty soon but i have a question for you for any like mums and or parents who are watching this now of autistic kids and they want to know you know how did my kid make friends how can they have relationships what would your advice be on on making friends friends who shared interests let them get involved in a lot of different things. For me in high school, it was horses, model rockets, and electronics. And horses were big, huge, number one. Mm -hmm. So this brings back getting exposed. How to get interested in model rockets? Because a science teacher was the head of the model rocket club. Nice. Um, that did not become a career thing. Um, animals, that turned into a career. But, it's but kids, have got it. kids today are not getting exposed to enough stuff that they could turn into a career. I think taking the hands-on classes out of the school is the worst thing they ever did. Yeah. Because yeah, the people I worked with at only metal fabrication shops, that started back with um, classes in school in, in metal working. Yeah, yeah. Hands-on is always best. You know, there's this thing in learning where if you have a lack of mass, then you, you, you're not going to get the concept. And you're absolutely right. You know, how are you going to know that you're into metal work if you've never even done any of it? So it's it's you're absolutely right when i was lucky enough to be in school in the in the late 80s early 90s and you know there was still kind of like hands-on type of stuff there you know we did a lot of electronics i made my own circuit boards you know acid acid baths and all that and and i and i have love i have a love for electronics because of that but in terms of yeah what you're saying now you know not just in school but a lot of kids they're spending so much time on video games which is cool i guess but they're spending a lot of time indoors on video games they're not getting any hands, you're not, not making things, you know, they're not exploring, like you said, different things like cross writing. Well, or, or, the thing I'm seeing with fully verbal autistic kids is two paths go play video games on a disability check or mm. get out, get a life. And I have had a lot of moms have trouble with letting go. And yes. I've also, I hear about the success stories. I was at the airport, I'm, and this is right now a real success story. A major airport uh, ran into the dad, we were on the same flight. And he was telling me how his son is doing all the ground jobs at the airport, de-icing planes, baggage, marshalling planes, fueling planes, absolutely loving it. Good. And he learned every single ground job and the airline loves him. Yeah. And he's somebody right now that would be 20s. This is somebody now. This is not somebody from, uh, you know, like in the 70s or something like that. That's amazing. That's good though. That, that is a good, and it's nice to hear success stories because we always hear a lot of doom and gloom, don't we, with autistic kids of this current generation. And it's like, oh, they can't do anything, but that kind of success story is really awesome. Well, then you then you, then you you get talking about all the aviation uh, geeks. Okay, there's a, I've worked with a really uh, 
a guy I really like. He, he um, sells books for me at conferences. We're aviation geeks. <laughs> and so we'll do things like we'll go find a YouTube video of Airbus is thinking their fighter jets on afterburner, you know, and go find those yeah. videos and watch them and kind of laugh about them. <laughs> okay, that's just an example of a shared interest. There you go. That we can talk about. Exactly. And and that's kind of like how friendships kind of evolve. You know, you have that shared interest and then you have some affinity for each other. And I think that's great. Um, well, and just and then livestock stuff, too. I mean, I've had um, I've had some very good clients of ranchers that and um, again, there's something where there's a shared interest. And I'd like to encourage shared interests in things that can turn into careers. Yeah. And yeah. one of the problems I got with the video game stuff is that these kids are not going into the industry. No, that's not what's happening. They're just using the the the, the games. They're not actually kind of yeah. That's another they thing. They don't go into the industry. This is yeah. this is the problem. Yeah. But it's a it's something that I think once the parents understand that uh, you know the kid is more capable than they probably think because they've been told by the doctor. Oh, you know, like you said, oh, little Jimmy's not going to do anything, and the parents are stuck in this kind of like they're not letting go of that label. Um, I think you'd have a lot more evolution in, in the fact that, yeah, a lot this, of these kids. This is, this is the problem. Now, where a diagnosis is really helpful, I've got another book, Different Not Less, mm. and it's 18 older people in jobs ranging from veterinarian, doctor, tech jobs, and tour guide, supporting themselves in jobs who find out they're autistic later on in life. And where the diagnosis was helpful is in understanding their relationships, like maybe with their spouse. Yeah. That was helpful. It was almost a relief, mm. but these are people that were already are in careers. That's a, yeah, that's super interesting. Cause like I, uh, oh, sorry, give me a second. Yeah. It, you know, that is super interesting. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm going to try and wrap this up now because I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours, but we have to uh, come to an end. Um, so Temple, um, you said that there was a, you've got a new book coming out in October. Yeah. It's in October. It's going to be called visual thinking. And it's going to be looking into some of the hidden genius um, behind visual thinking. Um, I'm an extreme object visualizer, cannot do algebra and higher math. And what I'm finding in engineering, I actually went back through all the projects I worked on, major big factories I worked in, major construction projects. And I realized that the way the engineering work is divided up is that my kind of mind, the people mm -hmm. that own the metal shops, maybe barely graduated from high school, they do what I call the clever engineering department. Think packaging equipment. Yes. You know, complicated mechanical equipment. Yeah. yeah. Then your engineer with a university degree, he'll do the boilers, the refrigeration, make sure the roof doesn't collapse, <laughs> uh, water and power. You see the more mathematical parts of it. Yeah. Every project, I don't care what company I work for, and I've worked for all of them, I saw that division of engineering labor. And what's happening is um, the small shops are not forming now mm, mm. because those kids are getting shunted in special ed. Yeah. And, then and right can't... now in the US, if you want to build a poultry processing plant, you're going to import all the equipment from Holland. Wow. And that goes back to um, keeping their skilled trades. And there's a tendency, it, it's a different kind of intelligence. Yes. It's not mathematical. And it's part of engineering. Hmm. And this is something now I'm getting very, very interested in because uh, our clever engineers are not getting replaced. Right, right. And right. they're ending up playing video games on disability check, not to be building things. Yeah. That's and the not... thing is, it's all about work. I mean, when I saw Elon Musk, a big, huge article in the Wall Street Journal selling all these fancy houses and all the picture of all the houses so he can go live in his boxable, yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah, that's because lovely. it's all about what you do. Of course, because what you do, rockets and, and electric cars, is just so cool. It's yeah, it is cool. Your meaning in life, I can relate to that. Why he sold those houses? Yeah, of course, because those things weren't bringing him that meaning to what no, he was they doing. Weren't, right? They weren't meaningful to him. That I, that's the reason. Do you know? And I love it. it funny enough, Elon Musk, one of my favorite guys, because being a chemist as well myself, like you know, I just love the whole rocket science stuff, and you know. I, the whole SpaceX thing is just absolutely fantastic. And I, I follow what he does very closely. I think it's fantastic. It really is good. Oh, he just had a gigantic full color spread in our top business publication of all the houses he had sold. Wow. I'm just came out that. last week. 
Okay, I'll try and find that. I'd love to read it's that. It's in the Wall Street Journal, okay. and it's in the it's in the business section. There's like two sections of the paper. It's front page of the business section, and and full color spread uh, of the houses he decided he just didn't need, and that's completely public information. Wow. But I, I just, can just I can relate that. to that because I, I don't live fancy. I don't, I'm, you know, I think I have made my kitchen look presentable. I find that's good enough for Zoom conferences. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. put a background up there that just eats up bandwidth on my internet connection. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Also, it's you get weird stuff where you start hitting the background. My student, one of my students had a bun on the back of her head. <laughs> and when she hit the background, she had a unicorn spike coming out of her head. <laughs> 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 I said it really looked terrible. You might be better off <laughs> just having your apartment in the background. Yeah, she's just gonna put up a sheet next time. <laughs> just like oh, yeah, it 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 uh, or just you know the house a lot of most of anything the, a lot yeah. of the house because now it's just a white wall. Oh man, that's so funny. Oh good. But well, I can relate to where you are what you do. Yeah, yeah, you are what, what you do. And when I'm at a hotel and I've got nothing to do, I'm um, oh, I watched the Paralympics the other night. Oh, the slalom skiing. Oh, mm. that I really turned on by that. As somebody who's a paraplegic can now do really cool slalom skiing. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. That's the isn't kind it? of stuff I like. Yeah, accident engineering triumph as well, isn't it? But like, yeah, I, I, I'm the same. I geek out, you know, like to relax. I, uh, I watch documentaries or, or I, I take learning courses to learn more things. I find like I have to always learn, you know, because I get really depressed if I don't learn. So I always have to well, learn new my things. My relaxing breakfast reading is science and nature. That's my serious, relaxing breakfast reading. No, same, dude, same here. Like I, I just bought this book. Um, this is a, um, this is a marketing book on building funnels on websites and I just got it and I'm so excited to read this in bad, like you have no idea. So, yeah, and then you're going to do something really cool on a website. I am. I am. I'm currently programming the website. So I needed this as, and uh, um, yeah, this and, is a little guy. And sometimes simpler is better. You see, oh, and that's right. what Steve Jobs did with the iPhone because Steve yeah. Jobs was not a programmer. No, no, he's a he designer. An artist. A visual, yes, visual kind and of. You see, this is where the art kind of mind, working with the mathematical mind, he came up with the easy to use interface. Mm. But the more mathematically inclined engineers had to make that phone actually work. Yeah, that's that problem. <laughs> well, yeah, you had that's that problem, it. but the engineers tend to put so many features on it and get it so complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That... And the reason why Zoom took over is nobody had to learn how to use it. No, it just is, isn't it? You just plug and play. Do you know that's funny, Zebel? Like I, I, my iPhone is kind of like my lifeline. Like I use it for everything. And do you know, it, because it's user friendly, that's the the key to why this is so successful. And I think that it visually is just so pleasing when you use the operating system. Because I've used other phones and they're just you know Android and stuff. They just they're so complex and you have to like learn all about coding. And you I don't want to learn up about stuff. And and, um, you know, I do a lot of conferences and they, okay, like Zoom took over from WebEx. Actually, the guy who invented Zoom used to work for WebEx. Wow. And they wouldn't listen to him. So he started his own company. I, I, I've had nothing but trouble with, um, with WebEx because um, yeah, a lot of corporations too. use it. And, and if you don't have that corporate email address, getting into oh, yeah. a WebEx conference is just horrible. That's a and I've had some big conferences uh, where I always, uh, if I know they're using WebEx, I send my PowerPoint to them. So when we have to revert back to the phone, and that's <laughs> happened just... like three times, <laughs> yeah. um, we revert back to the phone. Yeah, WebEx and, is terrible. Which, you know, then they have to just put a still picture of me up um, because we can't get through the firewall. Oh, WebEx is horrible. I'm just so glad. I hate, Zoom I hate WebEx. I just despise it. <laughs> well, Zoom, Zoom is here to stay. And thanks to the pandemic, Zoom has been everywhere now. And everybody, everybody well, knows and loves it. What's happening, I'm finding, with the, when they have all these firewalls, is that personal email ecosystems are forming around big corporations. Hmm. I did a cattle conference for a major company. I think we'll leave their name out of it. Major, major, major multinational company. A sponsored a cattle conference and i said why are you writing to me on a gmail address yeah. and he said because our firewalls are so 
difficult to use. And I find that sending my PowerPoint slides to people, I have to send them to Dropbox to personal email addresses. Yep, yep. That because you can't, uh, that's the only way I can get them to them. Yeah, I've had it loads as well. I will say, why are you using a Gmail account? Because <laughs> well, I have asked, and, and this is, and schools are terrible too. Oh, yeah. And I have to send it worst. to somebody's home email address. Yeah. And what's happening, and I don't think the IT people realize it, is you're getting these ecosystems forming. Now, of course, the stuff we were sending is totally not confidential. Mm-hmm. Scheduling a cattle conference is not confidential. No. And at a, at a PowerPoint on cattle handling is definitely not confidential. You know, and I yeah. guess there's some, some stuff, uh, their new product development or something like that. They've Hopefully, they're not using a Gmail address for that. Um, well, yeah. But it not. just gets too difficult. And and then I was doing a Zoom call to, to um, South America, and some servers went down in South America. Three hours later, they sent me StreamYard.com. Oh, yeah, StreamYard, yeah. I got right on it. I figured out how to use it all by myself. Good. I, I got onto StreamYard just fine. Good. And I didn't have to have any training. I'd never even seen it before. See, that, that's cool. That means that the software is very good to use, and that's a good thing. And then I could see that it's a conference software, that it had a backstage and on the stage. But that was real obvious mm. how it mm. worked. I did not have to get on the f- mobile phone and call that. <laughs> <laughs> how do I get on this, this site? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I've had, a few, I've had a few conferences like that when I ended up just phoning them and you're sitting there on the phone thinking, I hope they're getting this. <laughs> I'm just sitting here like, oh, okay. And I've had okay. WebEx conferences where fortunately I had sent the PowerPoint into the, you know, the home email. Yeah. And um, we had to revert, revert to my cell phone I've even had WebEx conferences. Well, the way we do them is I have the host put their cell phone on speaker <laughs> and put it next to the mic on their computer. Oh, my gosh. Well, and it worked. It worked. And I have done some big, important conferences that way on WebEx. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, well, that's why Zoom rules. <laughs> well, that's the reason. Yeah. Oh, anyway, and the, cor- see, the, the WebEx works fine inside the corporation. Yeah, that's, that's what it's built for, you know, but externally, that whole externally, access. Externally, uh, you, you know, you're trying to have a conference with guest speakers. Yeah. It's been horrible. And then I also am on some animal welfare committees. They're on WebEx and a lot of those I've had to um, just be on the phone. Hmm. It's it's just atrocious. Yeah, it is atrocious. Good words to use. All right. Temple, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Really appreciate it. And if people want to learn more about you, your website is... I have templegrandon.com for autism, just run together, lowercase, grandon.com, just my last name for my livestock uh, uh, materials. And uh, of course, I got lots of books, both livestock and on autism. And at the age I'm at now, I want to see the young kids coming up today, get out and get into interesting careers. Me too. Um, I love that. And at the veterinary conferences that I just came in from, I talked to two autistic students. And I said, go for it. Good. Go for it. Do it. That's what they need. Encouragement and positive, uh, positive reinforcement. Thank well, you, and then Temple. coaching. Okay, like early in one of my jobs, I criticized some welding in a really rude way. And I said, what pigeon do? <laughs> and the plant engineer coached me that that was not appropriate thing to be saying, made me apologize. And uh, he told me what I should do. And so this autistic veterinarian may need to be coached a bit on some stuff on how to work with clients. Also the veterinary jobs where you don't have to work with clients all the time. Yeah, of course. Like the, uh, you know, like science jobs. Yeah. There's loads, there's loads. You could just be, yeah, somewhere in in the back and you don't have to do front facing customer service, but yeah, there's so many and there's there's so many careers. um, But um, I'm sure that when you start exploring, when the kids start exploring, when the parents help the kids start exploring, I think there's going to be loads of doors opening. Well, we've got to get one thing. Kids have got to learn how to work because I've had all these granddads come up to me. Grandmoms come up to me, decent jobs, pharmacist, had the job for years, Um, accountants, engineers, builders, Mm -hmm. and they all had paper routes at a young age. So they learned how to work at a young age and we've got to find substitutes for paper routes, like, you know, volunteer jobs where that's on a schedule um, where someone outside the family is the boss. 
Yeah. yeah really, yeah. really important. The other thing, I want to give a couple of tips. I just heard a sad story about a guy that was working for a fencing company, had worked mm-hmm. for them for years, got a new boss. And one of the problems I have is I can't remember long strings of verbal instructions. Mm-hmm. So they gacked out a bunch of long strings of what they're going to build that day. And he was kept doing it wrong. I have to write down, okay, you want this fence built here, mm-hmm. uh, a little checklist, like a pilot's checklist. Yep. Of what I'm supposed to do that day. And then I'm going to be fine. Yep. But I do not remember long strings of verbal information. And he lost a job at a fencing company because of that. Wow. See, this is something where he should have just said, Pilots have to have a checklist. I need one too. Yep. Um, that's all the disclosure I would have done. Yeah, it's just accommodation. Right? Let me just let me just put some bullet points down for my checklist of what you want me to build today. Right. We should wrap up. Um, Temple, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure and an honor again to have oh, you 